certain pieces of gear that really stand out above all else. There's certain pieces, there's certain tools that exist that are widely regarded as incredibly useful, incredibly influential. Things like the humbucker, things like the Stratocaster, things like the Marshall Plexi. But in my mind, I think there's one piece of gear, one tool that stands above just about everything else in the guitar world. And that is the P90 pickup. To me, this is the one pickup to rule them all. These were some of the first widely available mass-produced electric guitar pickups out there, and as a result, they've been used by pretty much everyone. From our very first guitar heroes to the players we love today, the P90 has absolutely stood the test of time. So in today's video, we're gonna take a closer look at this iconic pickup, figure out what makes it work, and try and find out what is the P90 sound. <laughs> single coil pickup that Gibson had that was chrome covered. They got away from that design. There was a lot more parts, you know, it was a bit more expensive and more difficult to make. So then uh, they redesigned it as the P90 as we know it. And P90 was just an uh, internal number for that, that design development and it just stuck. So in 1946, we now have the P90 as we know it. In 1946, Gibson was looking to add a new pickup design to their growing line of electric guitars. People were coming back from the war, manufacturing was opening back up in the United States, and they were looking to capitalize on that. At the time, their main pickup offering was what we call the bar, or the blade pickup, often referred to as the Charlie Christian, and they were looking to replace that, thus the P90 was born. Now, basically, as soon as the P90 was put into production, it became the main pickup that was used across their entire guitar line, most notably in the Les Paul, the Gold Top Les Pauls. And it worked out that way for about the next 10 years or so until around 1957 when Seth Lover ends up designing the PAF. Now, interestingly, the PAF is designed off of the P90. You can almost think of it as a dual coil P90. In fact, I made a whole video about the PAF sound, which you can check out here. Now, once the PAF started to take off, Gibson kind of phased out the P90, and it wasn't really featured in almost any of their guitar designs for around the next two decades with a few different reissues. Now, around the late 60s and early 70s, P90s started to grow in popularity, specifically with the growing punk rock scene. These early punk rockers started picking up Les Paul Juniors and Specials because they were cheap. They were leftover sort of pawn shop guitars, and they quickly found that the P90 sound worked incredibly well for the raw, loud, punk sound that they were going for. Players like Johnny Thunders from the New York Dolls, Mick Jones from The Clash, and Steve Jones from The Sex Pistols were all sort of early adopters of this punk rock guitar sound. These old leftover guitars that people weren't really interested in at the time quickly became the sound of what was to become one of the most influential uh, music genres of the time. Thanks in large part to the P90 pickup, the P90 sound. <laughs> composition of the Alnico evolved over a period of time as Alnico itself evolved. So you know, Alnico 2, 3, 4, and 5 were used for P90s over different eras. But aesthetically they look the same with the six screws, the two bar magnets on each side, and those screws go through a steel keeper 
And the two bar magnets have light poles facing, which causes that magnetic current to go up and induce a magnetic field in the screws, right? Now, the key to the P90 sound is the pickup's construction. These are single coil pickups, much like you would see in a Fender guitar, for example, although they're quite characteristically different than a Tele pickup or a Strat pickup. These P90s in my Novo here are known as soap bar P90s because of the cover. It looks like a bar of soap. And underneath this cover, you have two Alnico magnets. Now, Alnico was an alloy that was developed in the 1930s. It's an alloy of aluminum, nickel, and cobalt. And it's really popular with the guitar world, specifically for pickups and speakers, because it's a lighter weight material that allows you to build a stronger magnetic field than the materials that were available pre-Alnico. That's why if you ever check out a real old Charlie Christian pickup, they're really heavy and bulky. Part of that is because the alloy that they were using in that pickup for the magnets were really heavy. Now, the magnet alloy isn't solely responsible for the P90 sound. It's also the winding. Now, much like PAFs are known to be incredibly inconsistent, so are P90s of the time. And also, a lot of the early P90s weren't wax potted. And if you've ever played a non-wax potted pickup, they're known for being incredibly microphonic, which means they pick up the vibrations like a microphone would. And that has an effect on the tone. Uh, you know, things were, were cool back in the old days, but it wasn't quite as accurate as they are now they didn't have automatic stops on the machines so you could have you know a group of ladies winding coils and maybe the brake whistle blows and then they stop the machine and then come back take off those coils maybe you have some that are underwound or they look at the clock and they go well i got another minute or two you know i'll just let this one roll and then i won't have to start another one right so there's a lot of variation back then awesome now, the reason yeah. I love P90s so much is because I really think they're the most versatile guitar pickup ever made. They sort of sit in between a single coil like you'd get in a Fender guitar and a PAF style humbucker like you would see in later 50s through the 60s Gibson guitars. You can get the top end clarity and chirp of a good single coil and then you get the nice mid range punch and round low end that you might get from a solid PAF pickup. And the output of a P90 pickup has a massive effect on the tone as well. I think even more so than humbuckers. Lower output, lower resistance P90s have way more clean headroom and they make great options for cleaner style playing. They're incredibly articulate, but not shrill or thin in any way. Whereas hotter P90s like these Amalfitanos here will absolutely crush the front end of an amp and get you tons of gain not as much headroom. They tend to compress way sooner than a lower output equivalent. But if you want something that's gonna hit the front end of your amp pretty hard, it's hard to beat an overwhelmed P90. Now, I think there's one example that shines above all else that will really demonstrate the versatility of a P90 equipped guitar. And to demonstrate it, I borrowed this gold top Les Paul from Rick Beato. I don't have a gold top and you kind of need one for this example. But this is an example of how the P90 can really act as a chameleon. For years, I thought this solo, this iconic solo that we all know was recorded with a completely different guitar. I always thought it was recorded with a Strat neck pickup. But it wasn't. It was recorded with one of these. And if you don't know the solo I'm talking about, it's this. That's 
That's right. Gilmore played a gold top Les Paul with P90s on the Another Brick in the Wall solo. Now, the signal chain, the way they actually got that sound is pretty interesting. He actually recorded DI into the console where they gated and compressed his signal and then sent it back out through a Mesa Boogie Mark I and recorded it. They actually reamped the solo. Now, I approximated that tone with an Axe FX3, and I'm using a high watt model instead of a Mesa Boogie, but I think I got pretty close. And that should go to show that even though this guitar is different in just about every measurable way than a Fender Stratocaster, because of the P90s, because of these amazing single coil pickups, it can cover a lot more ground than its shape and body construction would suggest. So that is the P90 sound. If you enjoyed today's video, let me know by leaving a like and a comment down below. If you want to support the channel, check out the links in the description box down below. Also, huge thanks to Carter Vintage Guitars and Gibson for setting up that whole shoot and letting us play those amazing vintage guitars. And special thanks to Jim DeCola for coming out and talking to us about the history of the P90. Also, huge thanks to my friend Zach Broyles from Mythos Effects for playing earlier. He and I started a podcast not too long ago called Dipped in Tone, and we've, uh, we've had a ton of fun making it. It's a weekly podcast here on YouTube. I'll have it linked down below. You can check that out. If you are into uh, guitar nerdery, which if you made it to the end of this video, I imagine you are, I think you'll like that podcast. Anyways, that's all for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. My name is Rhett Scholl. Thank you so much for watching. And remember, there is no plan B.